Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with another round of Deep Space updates. Trying to get back on schedule here, but the last couple of weeks we've had, well, we had the massive worldwide event that was Launchapalooza, a day in which rockets from all over the world launched. We had five launches within your 24 hours of August 4th. It started with a, a Long March 4B launching a couple of uh, you know, commercial payloads, I believe. Uh, there was TECUS, the Terrestrial Ecosystem Carbon Inventory Satellite, and another spacecraft called Jiangtong-4, which was supposed to track marine shipping. This was notable because it was the 100th successful consecutive launch for a Long March rocket since their last failure. Of course, that does include Long March 2-4 to 4 and 5 and 6 and so on. Those are all very different designs of rockets. Next, we go to New Zealand, where Rocket Lab was doing another launch for the NRO. This was Antipodean Adventure NROL-199, and it was originally scheduled for the second, but it was cancelled uh, due to winds. It launched on one of the recoverable boosters with the red stripe on it, but there was no recovery attempted. One thing that was noticed by some eagle-eyed viewers was that the launch looked like it was going to make a turn to the south, a dog leg to the south and then to the north. And people weren't quite sure what to make of this, whether this was some sort of debris de uh, avoiding avoidance maneuver or whether they were just making it hard for people to on the ground to take a look at things, which, you know, NRO doesn't necessarily like people on the ground looking at its satellites. And yeah, that brings us to the next launch, which was Atlas V, launching the Spurs GEO-6, the final satellite of the SBURS space-based infrared system, which uh, of course are you know, missile detection early warning satellites. Um, this also marked the return to flight of the RL-10C-1-1, which was their uh, modified engine, basically they were taking RL-10 engines from the Delta and adapting them for use on the Atlas. And they had a problem about a year ago when the nozzle oscillated in a way which was unanticipated and potentially damaging. It turns out that they've cut about 11 inches off the nozzle extension and they're just going to fly with that. Also, by the way, this is the last time an Atlas will fly with a 4 meter fairing on the east coast. There's one, another launch on the west coast, I believe. But yeah, you have to see this absolutely fantastic footage from amateurs on the ground. Uh, this is a, you know, you can see why the NRO is getting more and more concerned about what amateur footage can deliver, <laughs> right? Uh, this is like an 11 inch telescope being driven by tracking software. Anyway, moving on, we have Long March 2F. So the 2F is usually used to launch the Shenzhou spacecraft, but in this case, it was used to launch the reusable experimental space plane, right? And this was a very mysterious launch. I don't think there's any footage out there of this actual launch, although maybe maybe I might find something after starting to edit this video. This was, this, so the China's like, experimental reusable space plane, there's been a lot of secrecy surrounding this. When it originally launched a couple of years ago, there were all sorts of notices on social media saying, do not post any photographs of this. They were very concerned about the fairing, apparently, which, well, you know, they, they were for this one, which makes it all more interesting when they decided to exhibit the fairing after it fell back to Earth at a middle school or whatever in China, and somehow the video got leaked and shared and has been taken down. But of course, we now have great footage of this fairing, uh, some really nice reference markings to figure out exactly how big it is. And it looks like the fairing has a couple of cutouts in it and they're in exactly the right place you would put cutouts if the fairing was being designed to carry the US's X-37B. So this does look like they've taken a good design, which has been, of course, designed largely in public before it became a military project, and just went with it. Now, granted, they're going to have probably their own hardware building this, but yeah, you know, <laughs> it does seem to imply that China's space plane is pretty much, at least externally, a copy of the US design. Anyway, um... Moving onwards, we finally come up with Falcon 9 launching the Denuri or 
the KPLO, the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, a satellite which is going to take a low orb or energy trajectory to the moon, enter orbit in December, and then you know, survey the moon with its array of scientific instruments. Yeah, this was you know pretty stunning, right? It meant that we had actually two launches from Florida within 24 hours of each other. And that is not something we've seen in a very long time. I think the last time would be like during the Gemini program where they were launching the Titan and launching the Agena very, very quickly. Uh, there's also an interesting payload that went along with this. There was a an image mosaic where if you were apparently part of the Tesla referral program and you succeed, you know, got your friend to buy a Tesla, you could submit a photo to fly in space and they flew this photo mosaic built out of these photos. Uh, yeah, it was quite a day. Launch a Palooza. Let's hope we have more of that. Yeah, so the next launch after that was on the 7th with the debut of India's small sat launch vehicle, which um, is a three-stage solid rocket with a fourth stage as a uh, velocity trimming stage is what it's known, a velocity trimming module. So three solid stages and then a liquid fueled stage to make sure the thing gets into orbit just right. This sh is theory able to launch about 500 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Unfortunately, this debut launch was a failure. Uh, the two satellites re-entered soon after. It looks like they went into like a 400 by 75 kilometer orbit because the fourth stage only burned for 0.1 seconds. Yeah, that left them about 100 meters per second short. So. It's not clear what happened, but sounds like, from, from what I understand, is that there was, during the separation of the second to third stage, there was a glitch in the accelerometer for a few seconds. And the onboard computer said, uh-oh, my accelerometer is broken, and switched from closed loop guidance, where it's reading that accelerometer and adjusting its, its trajectory, to just ignoring that and flying a pre-planned uh, trajectory based on the information it had. And I guess that meant that it thought that it didn't need any more performance to get into orbit. So the third stage probably underperformed by that argument. Regardless, yeah, the fourth stage didn't trigger and didn't put it into orbit. And so, yeah, that's unfortunate because, you know, there was all, all sorts of like educational payloads on there. I saw an article about how all these school kids are so unhappy about their satellite burning up in the atmosphere. The 9th of August in China, we have the Series 1 launching by uh, from uh, Galactic Energy. This is another mix and match solid rocket, you know, stack of solid rocket motors from a non-government launch provider in China. Uh, this is actually one of the more successful ones. They've had three successful launches now, 100% uh, success rate. Uh, they've launched in this launch uh, two Tianjin satellites for Minospace, space, and the third was a satellite uh, called Donghai. 9th of August also had uh, Russia launching a space, uh, launching the Kayam satellite for the Iranian space agency on a Soyuz rocket. This was alongside about a dozen other CubeSats for various Russian organizations, universities, and, and such like. Now, in reality, Kayam is a Russian-built Earth imaging satellite that was paid for by Iran. The launch was from Baikonur, and it's notable, or it's believed that this rocket the booster used was originally bought by OneWeb to launch their constellation. Uh, of course, they didn't end up paying for it, but that was originally allocated to OneWeb to launch their uh, hardware. 10th of August, we saw another launch of you know, 52 Starlink satellites from Florida. And honestly, I can't think of anything to, cool to say about this, which is good because, you know, we've got to get through this. 10th of August, there was a Chinese Long March 6, that's the cryogenic version, launching you know, a handful of remote sensing satellites into sun-synchronous orbit. And finally, on the 12th, there was a Starlink launch out of Vandenberg, which again, I tried to see with binoculars, didn't really see it this time. Uh, it, for once, it wasn't completely clouded in by a marine layer. It's also notable because the booster for this had previously been serving on the East Coast. It actually launched Crew-1 and Crew-2 and had been operating in Florida at, as late as June. Then it got shipped across the country and is now helping out in the West Coast, which I think is a good sign. It means there's a lot more launches that will be expected down my way. But yeah, I, I really means I need to stick to schedule with the Deep Space Update so we're not spending 10 minutes just talking about rocket launches. 
Note that there's a problem talking about rocket launches. But we have all sorts of other news to talk about. First of all, Astra has announced that they are cancelling their Rocket 3.3 to focus on their larger Rocket 4, which uh, on paper scales up the payload capability from about 50 kilograms to 600 kilograms. It's propelled, it's believed it's propelled by Reaver engines from the Firefly uh, aerospace. And, you know, this is a pretty big gamble for them, given that the cash, the reserves they have on hand are sort of running out. It also means that NASA is potentially looking for a new provider for their Tropics mission, which was something that really benefited from having a small rocket that could do a couple of satellites into a single orbital plane. Uh, in the meantime, of course, a Astra are also scaling out the production of their Astra spacecraft engine, which is an electric engine that was originally developed by Apollo Fusion before they acquired that company. Uh, space, Star, SpaceX, of course, had lots of excitement in the last week as they finally got some real rocket engine testing going on at Starbase. Uh, on one day, they tested single engine burns of both Booster 7 and Starship 24. And then day after, I think they managed a 20 second burn for a single engine on Booster 7. Now it's rolled, the booster's been rolled back to the high bay and they're putting in the center engines again and we're looking for bigger and better firing. <laughs> no point. Uh, on the other side of things, SpaceX lost out on $900 million worth of rural broadband subsidies. That was the, the Rural broad, uh, Broadband Digital Opportunities Fund, which happened like in around the end of 2020. Uh, basically, uh, you know, they they were awarded them, but they had to complete like the long form application. And in the end, there's been enough changes. The performance isn't quite as good as is needed to satisfy the requirements. And also, pretty much everyone saw that the the rural you know awards funds, well, the process was terrible, right? There was all sorts of places you know census blocks which were getting given awards. For not just SpaceX, for all the companies, right? I think, first of all, the top winner was a company called LTD, and they look like they're defaulting on all of their claims. There was a broadband award for like a tiny block, which was really a bunch of bushes in the middle of a circle of road, right? <laughs> like, yeah, there. Th this was not a well-run uh, award scheme. But regardless, I'm not sure where that puts Starlink. Obviously, they've got other investors from other sources. Uh, Artemis, Artemis just rolled out. Artemis one rolled out to the pad last night. It's sitting there, and you know, it's that means it came out early. Okay, they moved it up one day from the original schedule, and then they had to delay it an hour because it's Artemis, because it's SLS. Uh, but it's out, now out there on the pad. It's all buttoned up. Like there's not much that they can do now. It's on the pad. There's nothing that they can really service. The most that they can do is get into the capsule to change out stuff, put in like late load materials, like you know Sean the sheep, for example. You don't want him sitting around in there for too long. Uh, of course, I've I pointed out there's a, an iPad in there that's going to be working uh, an experiment with uh, North is it Lockheed Martin and Amazon and and Cisco. So yeah, that's going to be Hal for this flight. Um, Firefly and Northrop Grumman are now working together on the next generation of Antares. I have a whole video about that if you want to get into the weeds about that. Also, we had a NASA authorization bill was included in the CHIPS Act. Yeah, the CHIPS and Science Act was sort of signed into law. Basically, it's all sorts of incentives to produce domestic technology and included the first NASA Authorization Act in like five years. It basically requires uh, you know, support for NASA's exploration programs, a formal extension of the space station to 2030. There's a new Moon to Mars uh, office, program office. Um, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office is formally created. So, you know, this is kind of important. It's a kind of a, a requirement for a well-functioning space agency. Like the last time there was a NASA authorization bill, it was actually negotiated and led and su submitted by Bill Nelson and Ted Cruz back in 2017. And now Bill Nelson is, of course, administrator of NASA. And you can see how the sausage gets made. Uh, on the other pol political side... Um, Kamala Harris came to Oakland last week 
Uh, she was at the Chabot Space and Science Centre, which is, of course, a place that I occasionally go and give talks and talk, you know, look at cool things. So they basically brought together a bunch of commercial space companies, things like SpaceX and uh, Planet Labs, Capella. And the announcement basically was that the Space Council is going to take a look at how... Um, how commercial space is going to be managed under the US government. Uh, you know, there's a requirement under the space treaty that government agencies have to oversee any commercial space activity. And that, whoever's been responsible for that has sort of moved around with each generation of change in, in the White House. Um, so I think anyway, it wasn't much of an announcement in itself beyond bringing together a bunch of people to talk about what should be decided. Um, NASA changed or added or clarified their policy on visiting the space station. So NASA now made it clear that they are going to require an astronaut that has previously flown to the International Space Station to be on any tourist or private astronaut flight to the International Space Station. Now Axiom already flew uh, one with a former astronaut. The next flight from Axiom is going to include Peggy Whitson as a commander, but they had said that they wanted to transition to all newbie missions. And that's not going to happen now. That makes Axiom a little less profitable because they can't sell four seats. They have to have the fourth seat or the, the commander be an astronaut, someone that's actually trained. Also, I sort of missed that at Air Venture, you know, the Experimental Aircraft Society's big show, the Polaris Dawn team came in and they clarified or they, they talked about it. The, their flight was going to be, the, for the EVA, it's going to be in December by the looks of things right now. It's not guaranteed, but that's what it's looking like. Air Venture is basically where all the you know planes fly into every year and it's like epic party. Uh, so Jared, of course, flew in with his MiG-29 and wowed the audience. There's some photos there of MiG-29 on the runway at the same time as like an F-35, which is cool to see. Uh, Blue Origin... Uh, <laughs> Blue Origin have sent their ship, Jacqueline, off to the scrapper's yard in Brownsville. So Blue Origin were converting a car ferry into their landing barge for their new Glen. And they decided to go a different route. Word is that they have contracted with the same people that built the barges for SpaceX. And they're going to get a more traditional barge design rather than simply converting a cargo ferry. So yeah, Jacqueline, apparently named after Jeff Bezos' mum, yeah, it's now going to the scrapper's yard. I, I'm, I'm sure it's been renamed before that happens. Uh, what else? Oh, there was the small satellite conference where, of course, all the small sat people get together and you know party and talk about satellites, and they had an award ceremony and Capstone won you know small sat mission of the year or whatever. And, of course, there was also DEF CON with the Aerospace Village with, you know, they brought together hackers specifically working on all sorts of things. And there was an aerospace thing. They showed, there was one presentation on how to get into your Starlink terminal and start running, you, you know, your own code. Obviously, SpaceX discourages this. But when the, the hacker in question demonstrated this capability, they were quite happy to give him access keys and everything so, to see if he could figure out some other problems, you know, do some of their work for them. Yeah, okay, I think uh, I think that is Deep Space Update. I promise you I am going to get back to a more regular posting schedule. But, boy, it feels good to talk about all this. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.